I had an incredible year in 2015. I was on a high, you know, I, I made multiple six figures in my business. Um, I, I had an incredible year. So I was a little cocky and I, and I think that there was a part of me that thought, you know, this is no big deal. You know, I'm, I'm, I bought an 80 acre property. I'm taking on more horses and I added another component to my business, a hospitality, you know, mm -hmm. running as a retreat. But I also, I also operate all year round. And so I do, I do all kinds of events. Um, I've never had staff before and I knew nothing about any of it. So it's a big operation and yeah. I was naive and also thought no big deal. Um, I didn't actually give myself room to have a learning curve and also the financial obligation was like double what I had. Yeah. Um, and I think what I was unprepared for is the emotional toll. Um, you know, my first year here was probably one of the hardest years of my life. And I feel like I like barely got out alive. I went from having one business to run to two businesses to run to more horses to staff. So my energy and my focus was all of a sudden, it's like, how do I hold all of these things? And I, and I don't know how to do that. You know, I sort of was saying like, I kind of maybe know how when people, mothers have children for the first time and all of a sudden it's like, you're, you're, you feel like you're not in control of where your energy needs to go. And so that was very disorienting. It's Retreat and Grow Rich, the podcast. I'm Darla Ledoux, best-selling author, coach, and retreat leader. And I'm on a mission to normalize transformation on the planet, one intimate retreat at a time. This show is dedicated to the coaches, consultants, healers, leaders, and light workers who are here to hold space for the truth that transforms lives and get paid for it. Expert retreat and business tips, strategies, stories, and magic. It's your weekly mini retreat delivered right to your ears. Let's do this. Welcome to today's episode of Retreat and Grow Rich, the podcast. I am here with Hillary Schneider, and I know you guys are going to be so excited to hear from Hillary because not only does she have a retreat center, which I know it, to me just seems so amazing, and um, I know so many of my listeners, that's their vision, that's their dream, and you actually went for it. So I just... I know they're going to be delighted to hear your insight. She is the owner of Epona Rise Retreat Center in Canada, and it's in Western Canada. We'll talk a little bit about where specifically. And she's also a coach and trainer and beautiful transformational leader. So let's dive in a little bit, Hillary. Welcome. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. So I like to really start out with how did you, you know, get into, well, there's kind of two tracks, the world of coaching and empowerment, and then also, you know, where does your love of horses come from? So let's start with the yeah. first. How did you, how did you get yeah. here? Um, so that's, uh, I'll try to synopsis a little bit. Um, I, so I actually grew up, my father's a coach and, um, hmm. He's a coach for CTI, so he's worked for okay. CTI Institute for about 20 years. So I was, I grew up in an environment where, you know, coaching was sort of fostered in my upbringing. I got my very first coach at age 17 and wow. Um, yeah. So, and I kind of took to it and, and really found the relationship to be really empowering. And so, um, you know, I, I actually went to school to be a horse breeder and then I was looking to do something more fulfilling, you know, working as a horse breeder, wasn't doing it. And my first thought was, uh, you know, I might want to be a coach because I found so much value and I wanted to do something impactful for other people. Um, and so I, I went and did my coach training in 2006. Um, and the horses to me, you know, and I know we'll kind of get to that part, but I always sort of had this knowing that horses, could be a powerful component to how I could help people. And I actually discovered the coaching with horses track while I was doing my coach training with CTI um, in 2006. So that's sort of how I got um, introduced to the, you know, the coaching. That's um, amazing. Okay. So what was it like growing up with a dad who was a coach? Um, you know what? I really appreciated it. I think that um, to be in an environment, and I actually, now that I'm a little bit older, 
I've thanked my parents because I think it actually allowed me to, um, you know, put me ahead in life. And I think a lot of ways just in terms of um, being able to cultivate different relationships and conversations with people, just knowing myself and being empowered in my own values and belief systems and, um, you know, understanding, I think, you know, the personal growth and development, I think is such a powerful um, place for us to invest in. And that was always really empowered in my, in my home. So I think it, it was a really uh, beneficial and, and, and rich place to, to come from. And just being able to also cultivate conversations with my dad and, um, you know, both my parents actually where you could be heard and can be seen. And um, so I think it was, it was great. Um, it, I think it, it, it was a definite gift um, for me. Yeah. That's amazing. We always, I always believe, you know, as in working with my clients that as they shift and grow and become more empowered in their own, you know, I heard you say communication, which is huge that their kids will benefit. So it's so great to know. Yes, totally. You're real, you're living, breathing proof. I am. Yes. It's very true. Yeah. Awesome. So then you mentioned your love of horses and kind of always being aware of that. Where'd that come from? Um, you know, I didn't grow up on a farm, but, you know, horses sort of came into my life early on as a kid. So I have pictures of me on top of a horse at, you know, four years old, three years old. And um, there was something about the energy of a horse that really called to my soul. And I think I recognized that early on as a kid. And um it was a safe place for me. Um, I, I think that once I started to grow up, you know, I spent my summers going to riding camps. As soon as I was able to get a ride, I was, you know, cleaning stalls in exchange for, you know, being on top of the horse. But it was really the spirit of the horse and being with them that connected to something in myself. And so there was that sort of kind of soul recognition that I found with horses that, um, and there was a part of me that I knew from a young age that they would be part of my purpose. I didn't know what that was going to look like, but it just felt like they were an essential component to what that path was going to be. Well, what is it, you know, you mentioned your dad and your parents really saw you and you could be heard and seen and valued. How was it different with the horse? Um, you know, I think with horses, there's no bias, you know, horses, they don't have an ego, they don't have judgment, you know, even though my dad is a coach, my parents have a bias being my parents, right? So right. They have, you know, the fears and, and what they yeah. want for us as children. And sometimes, you know, that's my dad is my, my father is my father. Um, with horses, you don't have any of that. It's so there's just sort of this purity, I think, of um, an unbiased, non-judgmental, unconditionally the supportive uh, space to be held in um, that, you know, you feel very safe in, you know, with, with all places where, you know, as much as my dad is an excellent coach and stuff, he's still my dad. So, you know, there's, there's, there's right. times where he's showing up as my father and there's a little bit of bias there. He has a little yeah. bit of attachment to you being happy and successful and. Which he yeah. should, right? <laughs> right. I mean, don't have that. Yeah. Awesome. So were horses always a part of your life or was there ever a time when they weren't? Um, you know what? I, I sort of found a way to have them be a part of my journey. Um, I didn't get my first horse till I was 27. Um, like I said, I didn't grow up on a farm, but my summers yeah. were spent on riding camp. I volunteered at horse rescues. Uh, you know, I worked at stables. Um, I went to school to be a horse breeder. So I always found a way to have horses be included in my journey. Um, whether I had, you know, I physically owned them or not, it, it was all, you know, there's always ways to make things available to you. And so I just really sought out how I could, how I could do that for myself with them. Nice. So then how did you get into, you know, starting your own coaching business? Yeah, because so that came I actually, first, right? Before I, the ranch. It, it did. Um, it, it didn't, it didn't. I mean, coaching, I, like I said, I did the coach training way back in 2006 um, through okay. CTI. I, all I could do was talk about the horses. And it was actually through that training that I got connected to these women that were doing coaching with horses. So after I mm. did kind of the curriculum of CTI, I actually spent three years getting certified and trained um, with sort of the equine guided coaching or the equine 
facilitated learning and, and sort of started nurturing my practice coaching with horses. So I started off um, with, with the horse piece and um, I did that on the side. You know, I didn't actually go full time in my coaching practice till 2012 and because I leased my first retreat facility was actually property I leased and and I didn't actually separate myself from the horses I mean the horses are very included in what I do but I didn't actually you know put myself forward to start my own you know just as me coaching till 2014 um uh, but I was coaching with my horses but for actually a long time I was hiding behind my horses I think in a big way because I didn't actually feel like I had much to contribute Mm -hmm. beyond just horses yeah um and, you know, uh, buying a ranch or running your own facility um, sort of forced me into branching out outside of my, my herd, um, you know, just to support my business, right? It's sort of a big, I just have to let my dog out. Um, it's sort of a big, it's, it's, you know, and I'm sure we'll get to that, but having your own property um, is, is a kind of a big, a big commitment to hold. And so I had to, uh, ways to support that. Um, beyond just uh, the in-person experiences with the horses. Mm. So you really started doing more virtual coaching to fund everything. Was that part of it? Um, You know, it, it was a part of it. I think that there was a couple things that happened, you know, realistically I had to create a business model that supported my vision and just offering, you know, single sessions and, you know, workshops yeah. with my horses wasn't enough, you know, especially yeah. with the that I had. And then the other part of that was, you know, part of what my mission and, and what I do with, you know, my coaching work is, is helping people in some ways take ownership of what I call their medicine, you know, what are, what we bring into the world. And, and I had to kind of realize that I got to kind of take ownership of mine too, and recognize mm-hmm. it's not just yeah. about the horses, I have something to contribute. So it was sort of a blend of those two. It was, I think, owning my personal medicine in the world and then also creating a business model that would support my vision with what I wanted to do with this work. Yeah. Beautiful. Amazing. So you jumped into leasing a space. Yeah. How, how was that? You must have had well, a deep calling. What, how did that unfold? Well, you know, I got to a point, I actually moved um, to British Columbia from Ontario. So I lived on the East Coast, moved to the West. And Mm -hmm. I had sort of been doing my work on the side. And I just kind of felt like I I need to kind of see if I can do this full time, because this is really what I wanted to do. And um, so I I dove into lease, you know, which is sort of the softer, it prepared me definitely for this. Um, I, you know, I was really excited to be able to cultivate the space that I wanted, you know, um, so some people know when you, when you, when I run my facility, I'm in control of all those components of how I want the experience to be and the energy of the space. And, um, I could really kind of build my program. So it was a gentler entry into leasing. Um, it definitely, again, prepared me for, you know, buying a, a big property, um, and it taught me a lot about business. So it was an, an incredible growth opportunity, but allowed me, I think, to really step into what my purpose and, and work was. Yeah. Did you um, really feel like you could have control of the experience and the energy of the space when you were leasing? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. I was really, I was really fortunate. Um, and people commented on it, which was really cool. So I, I got this place um, that people in the community, you know, was, was owned by a couple. And when I bought it, people would come and knew the property and they commented how the energy felt really different. But I was fortunate in that case that the people who bought the property lived in the Yukon and I had a lot of freedom. And that was something I wanted to manifest that I could have a little bit of control about the energy of the space. So I did. Um, so yeah, I found I was really able to create the environment um, that I wanted and had a lot of freedom to do so. So it was a really great, you know, opportunity to kind of do that on a smaller scale before this place. And to know that you like it, right? Yeah, I do. What I love about it is I, I actually, and this was part of, I think my visions is I really like having a place that people can come and I can give them an experience into, you know, the horses or nature, that transformation. I really enjoy 
playing host to that. And, and I love um, creating a physical environment. So it actually was, it's very fulfilling to have my own space um, and to create those experiences for people. I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Nice. And yeah. how you mentioned your magic, your, your medicine, I call it your magic, yeah. your medicine. Yeah. How do you think your medicine had an impact on the energy of the land, like that people could actually notice it had shifted? And I know yeah, a lot of people well, listening are, are yeah. into that. So, you know, as much as you can share would be great. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, a piece of, of that for me is, is that connection to the land. Um, and I think, you know, setting that intention of, you know, being intentional about calling in the energies, um, knowing what the space needs. So, you know, even on my property here, I spent a lot of time just connecting with the land and, um, you know, cultivating and asking what does it need and what does it want? And, and it becomes a part of the experiences as well. You know, as much as I have the horse work, when people come here, there is invitation to also have that connection to the space. And I think when anything is acknowledged in that way, you're amplifying the medicine of it. So whether it be ourselves or the horses or the land um, and, and just spending time, you know, myself doing my rituals out there, meditating um, with, with the space and, you know, bringing it in as part of the creation of the container as if it's a living and breathing thing, I think really cultivates that energy. Um, so that's sort of what it looks like for myself. And then as part of the experiences I do, there's always, time spent really acknowledging the land and bringing it in as part of the process. So you said anytime you acknowledge it in that way, you amplify the energy of it. I, yeah, yeah, I feel that way. That's yeah. Really and I see, it with, I see it with my horses too. You know, I, I rescue horses um, and I get a lot of horses that come to me that same with people have various baggage and dissociation and, but I'm really giving them a place where they're seen in, in their teaching and it changes them. And I think it allows them to be in the authenticity of, of who they are, which, you know, I hope to give to people too. I think just that, just that intention um, can be very powerful. So I think whatever our intention is when we cultivate it and we create through it and we speak about it, um, it, it has a big impact and it's felt. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I work with, retreat leaders who are all in their own way, holding the space for transformation. And it is palpable. It is an yes. energy. You said it changes yeah. them about the horses. What have you noticed when they have that um, job, <laughs> so to speak? Well, you know, what's been really cool is I actually have a mare that I recently rescued, well, probably about three months ago, not one of my recent recents. And she came to me very dissociated and, 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 you know, you could, I don't know her full history. Sometimes I don't get it, but I've had a couple people, um, cause I just have had a couple of retreats and shared pictures that saw her when she first arrived and they've commented, like they see it, you know, her, her, she's present, you know, just the, the pictures you can tell that she's there, she's present and she's engaging with people, you know? So now, Whereas before she wasn't really coming into the space. Now she's coming up to people and holding space with the rest of the herd. And so you see it both in their interactions and just physically and in their energy and in their eyes, they start to, they start to change and kind of come into themselves. So it's just like people where we have the barrier up and the more we let it down, you can tell. Yeah. And you see it too. Like, you know, I had this woman here for a private retreat. And, you know, some, I have a volunteer staff and they all commented like from the first day to the last day, she looked differently, you know, mm -hmm. her eyes. Oh, yeah. So you see that. So it's the same thing with the horses. And I think even with the land, you know, um, we can, we can wake things up that way. Um, you know, it's, it's the same sort of for people and animals and environment and yeah. Um, so had you hosted a retreat before you leased your first space? Yeah, I had actually run, um, well, more workshops. So I, okay. I did, I had running workshops out of other people's facilities or, or you could okay. call them day retreats. I hadn't done sort uh -huh. of an overnight, um, but I had done it out of other people's places for a couple of years before I leased my own. Okay. Yeah. You just jump right in. Yeah, I really do. <laughs> So what was the process to go from leasing to manifesting this space that you purchased? 
Yeah, so in 2015, I had a really uh, profitable and really good year in my business. And I had two years left on my lease. And, and I just sort of, I think, I think we're guided intuitively. So I just sort of, yeah. these seeds started to be planted about looking to the future, what I thought actually was two years away, about what was next, you know, where would I go next? And um, I had a girlfriend of mine actually bought a property not that far from me and I saw pictures of her land and I just was like, where is that? I need to, and it was more just like, uh, there was this energy to explore. I originally thought in my mind, I'm just, I'm just looking for future. And then this property showed up in my inbox. And so I sort of say the property found me and I took one look at this property and I was like, it's like my dream property. It's like everything that I had seen as a child, like being in a valley and into the creek running through the property. And just, it was beautifully set up the lodge and the cabins and like, it was unbelievable. Um, I was feeling really confident because I had done very well in my business and because, you know, so part of that transition yeah. into online, I started building my brand. So I thought, you know, I might be able to pull this off. And I believe, you know, I think that my philosophy in life is you have to go for things, whether they happen or not. Um, I think our capacity is much greater. So, I mean, initially when I saw this property and I was seeing it, like people were like, you're nuts and you're crazy. And, but I did have a friend say, well, my parents, you know, my parents and, you know, and people, you know, it was, it was a very, you know, it's an 80 acre million dollar property. It's like, are you crazy? Um, but you know, my, a girl, a good friend of mine said to me, she's like, Hillary, if any, anyone can pull this off, it's you. So I, I went for it. But it was always from this place of I'm going for it because I think the universe put things in your path when you're ready. And I said, I'll just see. I'll go for it. If it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. At least I've, I've went for it and we somehow pulled it off. Yeah. Um, that's the first step. You know, that's actually in some ways the easy part. <laughs> you know, the, the, <laughs> the going for so, it. Yeah, the going for it. And, you know, <laughs> And then being in it and running it is like a whole different story. But I think I just have this philosophy in life that you, you got to try to go for things. Yeah. And if it's showing up, you have to trust that there's some part of you that's ready for it. And, um, and, and there's, there's no harm in just seeing, right. There's, there really isn't, you know, um, and, and you might do amazing things. I think our tendency as human beings is to be, more fearful than we do nurture the capacity of, mm. you know, what can pull right. off. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So. Yeah. And do you think that's part of the work you do with your clients, help them to go for it, whatever it is that's showing yeah, up? Yeah. And I, I do. And I think feel like they're, they're capable of it and they're worthy of it and they have capacity to. And I think what's really neat about this space too, when people come here is, they're coming to a place that that was very much a part of my journey. So I feel like part of the medicine of this land really supports going for our dreams. And, um, and to know if something is showing up, we we're, we're ready for it. I think sometimes we question, are we ready? You know, there's all of those, those doubts yeah. and those insecurities that really stop us from, I think, stepping into where we're being called. So I, yeah, I like to support people really connecting to the part of them that knows they're ready for whatever's calling them and that, that they can go bigger than they think is possible for them. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. I'm inspired. I'm so <laughs> grateful. You know, I, the way I was raised, actually, I have a little notebook. We make, we made these notebooks a while back that say where the desire is present, the way to fulfill it is also present. And I got that from one of my mentors early on. And prior to that, I had no concept of that. I definitely was playing it safe. The thought of, you know, trying something that I didn't know exactly how it would go was beyond my ability to imagine. So I love that you just dove right in. Yeah. I mean, th there's, uh, I mean, that's a whole journey in itself. You know, sometimes I think my insecurity is, you know, may, maybe, maybe I need to not be so there's, there's a, there's my own saboteur that says you're crazy and insane, but you know, it's, it's also, it's, it's something that I, I choose how I want to live my life. And I sort of, um, one of the things I'll say to people and I give it to myself is what's the greater consequence. I don't want to mm -hmm. get to the end of my life and feel like I didn't live it or I didn't try things. And yeah afraid so even if I fail or something happens 
I, I know that I put myself out there and I think that that feels important to me in terms of how I want to live and engage in my, in my life and, um, yeah. you know, to really honor why I'm here. Um, so I think that having that, you know, a different perspective and an anchor, as I call it, um, I think helps propel us to do things that are really terrifying or sometimes what people think is completely outlandish. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like it's just been smooth. So I'm curious, what have been the challenges? No, that's where I said, like, <laughs> <laughs> I know you mentioned to me that, that the running the ranch and working with, with all the horses is much easier than running a business. Yeah. You know, so this is where I was a little bit naive. I had an incredible year in 2015. I was on a high, you know, I, I made multiple six figures in my business. Um, I, I had an incredible year. So I was a little cocky and I, and I think that there was a part of me that thought, you know, this is no big deal. You know, I'm, I'm, I bought an 80 acre property. I'm taking on more horses and I added another component to my business, a hospitality, you know, mm -hmm. running as a retreat. But I also, I also operate all year round and I rent my facility to people coming. I'm 15 minutes from a ski hill. So I do, I do all kinds of events. Um, I've never had staff before. And I knew nothing about any of it. So, so you're I had to space. You were running all on your own. Yes, because it wasn't, it wasn't big and I didn't have cabins, you know? Yeah. So when I bought the place, you have a lodge, I have cabins. It's a big operation. And yeah. I was naive and also thought no big deal. Um, <laughs> I didn't actually give myself room to have a learning curve. And also the financial obligation was like double what I had. Yeah. Um, and I think, unprepared for is the emotional toll um you know my first year here was probably one of the hardest years of my life and I feel like I like barely got out alive and mm -hmm. I think a piece of that was I wasn't anticipating that there was going to be a learning curve and and also you know I went from having one business to run to two businesses to run to more horses to staff so my energy and my focus was all of a sudden like how do I hold all of these things. And I, and I don't know how to do that. You know, I sort of was saying like, I kind of maybe know how when people, mothers have children for the first time and all of a sudden it's like, you're, you're, you feel like you're not in control of where your energy needs to go. And so that was very disorienting. Um, and then it, it actually, um, I didn't even come close to my goals my first year. It was a huge blow to my confidence. And then I think just, um, the the one of my horses died like three months after I moved here. My adrenals went into fatigue, so I I just went into, you know, work 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 mode. Um, and then I was very unforgiving on myself. You know, it was just I had these expectations of how I thought it was supposed to look and and what I was meant to hold. And you realize with a bigger space, you can't operate the same way that you did. And um, and you have you have learning curves. You know, we can't expect ourselves to know how to do things. So it was hard. I think I feel like going into year three, there's a, there's a greater stability. I understand the moving pieces of all parts of the business, um, yeah. managing, you know, having the right support here. Um, you know, my, my business model again had to change a little bit because obviously I have a much larger overhead. And um, yeah. so one thing, one change, you know, we can do, but when you're having multiple at the same time, <laughs> Intense. It's a lot. It's a lot. Um, so it really stretched me um, in in a many different ways, and it wasn't. It it's not easy. You know, I think it's. Um, I have found some ease within it, but it's it's uh, the first two years were a challenge, and it, and I would say they were probably really challenging because. I didn't give myself space and room to have that growth and to and to yeah. learn things. Um, I didn't really take care of myself very well. Hmm. That's yeah. good advice for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, it actually took me, I, I actually got trampled by one of my horses my first year. Um, that was a really big wake up call for me. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I sort of say that you, you, you don't want to recommend something like that, but I, I had to kind of get knocked on the head to realize that I, and you know, a piece of it was too, like when you talk about the magic, what happened to me when I had all of these new things, I, my default when I'm stressed is to work harder and actually abandon that place of intuition and, 
an intention. And so um, I, I abandoned all of my practices and ritual that I believe so much in. And my horse trampling me actually forced me to come back to listening to how I create and how I manifest and to not get pulled into that sort of more masculine way of doing things. Um, so that was sort of a, a good lesson and um, where we have to listen, I think, to how we're called to, to grow and create. And you can do that, you know, with, I think, that intention and that intuition, which I really believe in. Um, but sometimes when things come at us, we forget that. And that's a little bit what happened to me. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, I'm imagining that the place has to keep running, but you're having yeah. to slow down. What are, you, you know, you mentioned staff a couple times and like, what are some of the things you learned to navigate that, to be able to yeah. run everything and still take time for you? Yeah. I mean, I think a, a piece of it was knowing the right support. You know, I, I think I figured out what it looks like to have the right support and that it, I don't have to do everything on my own. Um, I think, I think another thing is, you know, your business model, right. Um, is, you know, we've adjusted some things in terms of what our rates are and uh, you know, who we really need to cater to. And um, like I said, I have a facility where I run my retreats out of here, but we also, it's just a beautiful venue for different events. So, you know, it has become a popular thing for us and, um, you know, so we figured out who we need to market to basically. So there's a little bit of like, you kind of find your different niches and what supports the space. So, you know, having events here like weddings or, you know, or, or, you know, we have other people host retreats out of here. I mean, not, it's not all dependent on, on me. So, you know, I can really do what I feel energetically I can do. And then I always wanted to have a space other people can enjoy. So I actually love it when other people run their events out of here, retreats, it gives me sort of that pause. Um, but I also had to appreciate, you know, like you have to know your space and you have to know your market and you have to know your clientele and, and what you need to support it. So there was a little bit of, you know, figuring that out and then just building, um, you know, I had to appreciate that I was essentially growing a new business and where, you know, for my horse retreats, it was really great as I'd had this brand online. So that was, you know, I, I have, I didn't have to rebuild that, but for the place to support itself. So I don't have to that, that took some time too. Yeah. So, yeah. And did you, when you bought it, did it come with a certain book of business? Like you mentioned the ski lodge were people already used to coming for that, or did you have to develop all of that? So the woman I bought this from actually ran this place as a dude ranch. So it was a horse trail riding place and she was okay. only open half a year. So okay. even though like 15 minutes from a ski hill. So I looked at this place, like, you know, I can run all year. So she didn't have the same business model. Okay. So I had, I had to build like everything, you know, that whole clientele. Wow. From yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Do you have a lot of people ask you about what it's like? to run this property as a woman on your own? Um, you know, probably not as much as you would. I think people are very curious, even people who come here, like they're always, I think when they figure out I'm the owner, they're always sort of like looking like, how does that work? And so I find that, you know, I tell people the story that they're here. The woman who owned this place was also a single, you know, she was a single woman. But she had a very inspiring story too. But um, so yeah, I think I do get people that ask me, um, you know, my neighbors were very curious. Everybody is very curious about that. Um, so yeah, it is, it is a little bit a part of the curiosity of people when they come here. Yeah. I have friends that had a retreat space, um, in Oregon and it was kind of, you know, a bit outside of Portland, pretty, you know, a little more remote. And they were saying that, you know, and they're in the conscious community and would bring people out to the space but that connecting in with the local community was challenging for them. Have you found that at all? Um, I, you know, not really. I think that my first two years, I just kind of had my head down, but I think where I'm fortunate is I'm, I'm 15 minutes from a ski village and it's a smaller ski village. And um, I think you just, you have to make the effort. Um, so I, you know, I'm, I'm going up there um, I have my managers from Kamloops. Um, I've sort of, 
you know, I, wherever there's opportunity to donate to local causes, um, a, you know, a two night stay here, I'm doing it. So I think it's intention. Um, and I find the community here is pretty supportive. You know, once people find out that I'm here, um, but that has been an intentional, you know, relationship to cultivate, yeah. um, is the community. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So talk a little bit about the space. I've been on your site several times and it hasn't lined up for me yet with the number of people and the space, um, and the weather, the time of year. Um, but it's stunning. It's so beautiful. It's definitely, you know, the type of space that retreat leaders dream of. So talk a little bit about the space. Yeah, I mean, I'm super biased, but it's, I, so I, I'm in a valley um, up a mountain. So I'm just north of Kamloops, British Columbia. Um, so I'm in an interior British Columbia, about four hours from Vancouver. I'm about six hour drive from Seattle. So kind of giving people a little mm -hmm. bit of geography. And I'm up a mountain and um, the valley that I'm in is actually, so what we have in Canada, it's called crown land, which basically the state owns it and it's undeveloped. So there's thousands and thousands of acres I'm surrounded of, of just crown land. And then I have 80 acres, um, most of it being land for the horses, but it's, so we're in a stunning valley. The skies are absolutely incredible. Um, clean air, you know, you're up a mountain. So you, you're, you very have sort of that nature. We're 40 minutes from an airport. So it's not, you know, we're not super off the grid. Um, and I think what I love about this land, you know, we have, and we have the lodge and the cabin. So I have this big, beautiful, you know, stunning lodge with cabins for people to stay in. But I think that the, the, the amazing thing about this land is you have like different pockets of, you know, the trees have of incredible energy. There's a creek that runs through my property so people can spend time with water and, you know, big open fields. Um, my horses, you know, are on like 40 acres and just living as a herd. Um, so I think that there's almost this kind of wildness, you know, authentic energy about this land. 26 horses now? 26 horses, yeah. Wow. Yeah, we have 20 horses and, and they live as a herd. Like there's, I don't think there's many places where, you know, even with the horse component, you get exposure to, they basically live as close to a wild herd as possible. Um, so they live outside 24 seven, um, they're on 50 acres, but just people going into the space with the horses, being in their energy on the earth in a space that kind of has a little bit of that raw, very majestic wild energy to it is is pretty remarkable um yeah and then remind me is it six cabins that you have it's eight so it's it's cabins. four cabins cabins has two units so there's okay, kind of eight cool. units total um and then we do also we have a three bedroom apartment above our lodge that we will rent out as well sometimes like for retreat hosts if they want to add some more people to their space they can rent out an apartment um, and we have, I think it's, we have 14 beds plus the apartment. So there's 17 beds. So depending on sleeping arrangements, um, and then each unit has either one or two beds and a private bathroom. Great. So there's shared yeah, and a little ensuite. And most people find that they are, uh, pleasantly surprised. I think people think it's more of a rustic. Um, it it's quite it, lux to me. It's, yeah, it's definitely not like it's not rustic. Um, private ensuite, you know, custom made wood furnishings. The beds are very comfortable. Um, it's it's a pretty beautiful space to to land in. And then the meeting room is, you know, yeah. all windows, right? Describe yeah, that. So the yeah, so the lodge has, and that's like really kind of like one of the first things I fell in love with when I saw this place was those the windows face the valley. And so you have these massive windows that you see the valley and it's beautiful. It's a very inspiring space to be in. Um, the lodge is, is quite, it's got very, very high ceiling. So it's just kind of this really, it's an inspiring space. Most people feel like they're just very inspired. And, you know, we've had corporate groups in here do different things and they love the space. So you sort of feel like you are held in nature because you see it everywhere, even when you're inside. And I think that's the really cool thing is you're kind of have the comforts of having a space that is very beautiful, but it's in nature. 
And then how does your catering work? Do you have catering so I have, on site? Yeah, I have. So we do like, so people can self cater. Most retreats, you want to have a retreat, but I have a local woman and she lives in Sun Peaks and she comes and she does all the retreats and people love her. Um, she's a character. Uh, I have had people try to steal her from me um, because she's so lovely, but she's, she loves cooking and um, she puts a lot of love in her food and, and she cooks with, you know, we feed very organic, local, healthy food. Mm -hmm. um, so and she can do vegan and vegetarian, like whatever kind of diet people need. So she'll come in, she knows our kitchen very well and she'll do the cooking um, and yeah, it's all taken care of. Yeah. And she'll do all the meals and. Well, we actually, we typically do the breakfast. So if people, we do like a breakfast station and she'll do lunch and dinner. Okay. So we. Okay. We get breakfast. Yeah. Nice. I know, you know, if someone's going to, so someone could bring a host or bring their own chef with them, but then they need a room for that person and <laughs> they need to fly them out and all of that. Yeah, but that's where you know we have our apartment. Like, if you're bringing people in, can stay there, and you can save your cabins for your people. Mm. But I've had, I've had people, you know, and we have the full. It's a full industrial kitchen, so caterers and cooks love our space because yeah. the kitchen is pretty amazing that way. Awesome, love it. Okay, so let's talk about the horses. Um, because, you know, one of the huge benefits of someone bringing their group there is you, you know, they can create some kind of custom tailored coaching experience with the horses, correct? Yes. They, yeah. So I've done that with a few groups where I've blended the horses as part of what they're facilitating with their group. Um, and, and I can customize it. You know, I think the thing that's really amazing about the horses is it can blend with whatever intention you're holding. And I can kind of weave yeah. that into what I'm doing with the herd. But I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time, the horses are people's favorite thing because it's just, it's so powerful. Um, but it, but I can kind of, uh, you know, some, some groups have done two sessions, other groups have done one, but the horses are on the land. And I think, you know, if you're going to come here and you want to add a component, that's really powerful for what you're doing. Um, you can, that um and and you know we can create it where it fits for your workshop but uh i mean i'm super biased but i really don't think there's much that compares to the space that horses really hold for us in terms of and i'll talk a little bit about why horses but you know horses are i think very especially for women we have sort of this mystical intuitive connection to horses i think it sort of evokes that kind of intuitive language um it speaks to our soul and they're prey animals, um, which, which means they're very highly sensitive to what comes into their environment. So when you walk into a space with the horses, yeah. you're reading your energy. And there's, there's no better readers of energy than horses, I think. Um, the way that I facilitate is, you know, I bring people into the space and we see what happens. You know, how horses respond to a group, who steps forward. So when I, I'll go back to the medicine, each horse in my herd, I think, brings a medicine. So what's always really neat is a horse or some horses will step forward that really mirror the energy that you're bringing in the group and and it makes it very tangible so as much as many of us i think believe in that intuitive energetic space mm -hmm. having an experience with a horse that's a thousand pounds it makes it very real so it really grounds it and and we, you can't really deny and it's palpable um and people always are blown away by who steps forward for them, how the horse supports their space. And it, it just, it just lands, I think what you're doing, because with horses, you have to be present. You know, I think you absorb yeah. things and it connects in, in many different ways, um, especially if we're looking at overcoming, you know, our false self and our fears, we can deflect one another. You really can't deflect a horse and you really can't sort of deny and brush off what a horse is presenting to you. So it helps people to really have, I think that, affirmation of themselves and also um, overcome I think the places that they hold themselves back because the horse is holding it for them so if they don't believe me they'll believe a horse mm. and then you know it's what it's do you mean, uh, when you say the horse is holding it for them how how does that show up can you share an example yeah so I can share like so this woman who was here this weekend um like as soon as we stepped into the space, it's almost like the horses stop what they're doing 
And there was a couple cases where they just, mm. they held space, they just surrounded her and they just stood very still while she was journaling or what, what they were in process. And then as soon as they're done, they go back to grazing. But it's kind of a really cool thing to see them uh, stop what they're doing, grazing or whatever. And they just kind of step into this really calm, you feel it. And, um, and, and I had two instances where like my whole herd came for this woman and just like stood around her and just held the space. And then when they were complete in partnership with you, they can feel the intention that you're holding or is that coming Um, from her? I think it's coming from, it's coming from all of us. You know, I think Mm -hmm. I hold a a greater intention that whatever is meant for this experience is held. And then she has an energy she's bringing forward. So I think it's sort of like a, Hmm. it's a collective, collective holding, I would say. It's beautiful. I have taken clients on a horse experience in Colorado and we, you know, it was really around leadership and there was a particular thing I won't share, you know, her exercise that we did with the the woman that led it. Um, But it was really to have the horse do something and however they responded was always a mirror to how we're showing up as a leader in business. Every single person had a breakthrough, you know, just a new insight that they would not have seen without that reflection. Yeah. Oh, it's true. And that's, I think, the power of the horse is they're giving you that mirror. Um, and it's not coming from a place of ego and it's instant feedback. Mm. So that's the thing. They're giving you instant right. feedback of how your energy is showing up and, and what's happening. So you can actually see that um, and, and know where that disconnect is, is depending on how the horse is, is showing up for you. But, um, there, I mean, it's, it, and then you don't forget that it's, it's not like you can, you don't forget that experience and you're, and it's a whole body mm-hmm. too, right? It's the experiential component of your unit with them. Yeah. Yeah. To make the shift, you have to shift. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. So if someone, if, I know that people can bring people there and rent your space and work with you on an exercise for their clients. And then it sounds like also they can come and do a personal experience with you and the horses. How does that work? Yeah. So I do, um, I do privates retreats. That's sort of uh, the ways that I like the woman who was just here, she was on a private. So uh, it's, it's, it's a cool thing. Like if people are just, they, you know, we all need space held for us sometimes. And so my privates are also kind of custom depending on what people need, how much time they want to be in the space. Um, And then the whole experience gets catered around them, you know, so we have our days, usually about four to six hours with the herd. And then there's also time for processing and just regeneration and reflection in, in the space. So it's, it's a really kind of a beautiful container to hold. I do do group retreats too, but I do a lot of privates. I, I kind of really love, you know, the private uh, retreat space. Yeah. People can find out about that on your website, hillaryschneider.com, correct? Yes. All of it's on the website. Awesome. And we'll have the links on the show notes and the website for the ranch where they can check out the beautiful Valley is eponarise.com. E-P-O-N-A-R-I-S-E.com. Um, Anything else you want to leave people with, Hillary? Well, I think I know that one of the things you mentioned before, there's uh, for people that are curious about learning about the facilitation with the horses. So yes, um, a lot of people in my world are very interested in that, have either done some training or grew up with horses, but haven't had training, but, but they're, they want to really build their confidence. They're like, I have a sense I could do something with the horses, but I don't really know what I would do. (laughs) Yeah. So one of the things that I also do, and I've been doing it for four years and actually I think you can Margarita, who's a woman, I think you. Yes. I know Margarita. So I, I train Margarita. So, um, I, I will train people in this work. So if they're, if they want to, um, bring the horses in a component of what they're doing with their clients, I, um, you know, can give them some, training and how they do that. And I think what's a little bit unique about what I do is I, is I kind of customize it to what people's vision is of how they want to do the work. 
um, and um, support them and what that looks like to incorporating. Um, you can find that on my website too. That's with me. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, I think that's it. And then, you know, if they, if they are curious to hear more about, you know, my story and different things like that, I mean, they're welcome to kind of follow me on social media. Um, I'm always super happy wow. to also, you know, super happy to give people insight if anyone is listening and has questions or, you know, they want to pick my brain, you know, to a I had extent. another question, Hillary. If someone wow. wanted to take that training with you that, to learn how to facilitate with horses, do you recommend that they have their own horse already? Or is that something they can learn and, you know, yeah. work with other ranches and do the work with other yeah. horses? Yeah, for the first four years, I didn't have my own facility. You know, I think when I started mm -hmm. with Margarita, she didn't have her place or a horse. So you don't have yeah. to have your own. I think you, you want to have access to horses, but that's something yeah. I can help people develop is what that's going to look like. Um, awesome stepping into that yeah beautiful so exciting yeah. thank you so much for taking time to share yourself with me and with us and i i know at some point i'll make it to your ranch and bring some people so they can experience it with you yes i look forward to that and uh, thank you so much for having me it's always a nice thing to be able to share about you know the space and the horses and so i i feel grateful for that opportunity so thank you you're so welcome. I'm going to just press stop here. Press the wrong button. Okay. <laughs>I hope you enjoyed this episode of Retreat and Grow Rich, the podcast. If so, please share your experience and spread the word. Also, please subscribe over on iTunes and leave us a fabulous review. It makes a big difference in helping to get the word out. And you can join me in my mission to normalize transformation on the planet, one intimate retreat at a time. You can find show notes from this and all of our episodes over at alignedentrepreneurs.com forward slash podcast. If you'd like to understand the inner workings of my retreat-based business model and build your confidence in your retreat dreams, you can grab my book, Retreat and Grow Rich, over on Amazon. It's the Entrepreneur's Guide to Powerful, Profitable Retreats. If you're just beginning to explore incorporating small retreats into your business model, or you've been hosting retreats for years, but they're just not as lucrative as you'd like them to be, hop on over to retreatrevenueroadmap.com. Here you'll find a fabulous free gift. It's an extensive ebook that walks you through the three core types of retreats and how to use them in your business model to make great money and make a big impact. In each of these retreats, I'll let you know where to host them, what to include, where they fit in your business model, and the ever mysterious, what do you charge? You can find that at retreatrevenueroadmap.com.